often we get to that place where spiritually we feel we're at the end of our rope and tether. And everything which once felt vital and and alive to us, it's somehow like it's covered in snot. (laughs) 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 I hope you haven't had your breakfast yet. And really, what, what, we're, what we're thinking about in these, in these few weeks, um, really, is, as I've probably said to you, arose out of my sense of, God, God, I need to feel fresh and alive in you. And I want to partner with your Holy Spirit in that work, but I also want to be like the disciplined soldier who applies himself, who comes to God whether he's feeling like it or not. Do you ever have those moments where you don't feel like praying? Or is that just me? When you don't feel like worshipping, or is that just me? Or when you just don't feel like coming to church, I mean, obviously you've made it, but, you know, pray for those that haven't made it this morning. Sometimes that's the reality of our lives. Now, we've had a little devotional that we've been looking at. And uh, in the beginning of that devotion, uh, I put a, a paragraph by uh, Tim Keller, uh, the late Tim Keller, a Bible teacher. Uh, and he's been a student of uh, revival in the history of the church for For a long time, it's one of the things that interests him. It's one of the things which has really spoken to him. And he says this. You ready to hear it? He says, real revival is the intensification of the ordinary works of the Holy Spirit. The intensification of the ordinary works of the Holy Spirit. And the ordinary operations of the Holy Spirit are conviction, conversion, assurance, and sanctification. Okay, four big words for a Sunday uh, morning. Conviction, conversion, assurance, and sanctification. And he says, when those operations are intensified across the church, denomination, city, or country, you've got a revival. You've got a revival. When God is moving in such a way that people are coming under the conviction of their sin, they're turning to Jesus, there's a confidence that of what Jesus has done is really there and gives us boldness, and we're moving in increasing shades of holiness, becoming like Jesus. And then that happens in an intensified way, the church has changed and the world starts to take no. And that little paragraph has come from looking at very many moves of God. And so this Sunday and next today, we're going to look at the cheerful topics of conviction and conversion. You up for that this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to look at sanctification, uh, assurance and sanctification next week. For the reason that we want to be praying that God by his spirit will increase that amongst our friends and our family. That he will move in power by his Holy Spirit. Bring conviction, move people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that they may have an assurance of who Jesus is and that they may become uh, more and more like Jesus. That is the simple process that we are in, in sharing and believing the gospel for ourselves and uh, for our communities. And so we're thinking, how can we pray for these things in the lives of ourselves and in the lives of our community. There was a company um, whose name I can't remember because it's an old illustration and I've lost a long long since lost a little bit of paper where it had the company on. That's what happens when you move around. Uh, It's a a drilling company. And uh, they thought that their job was to drill holes. They thought that their their, their job was to make drills. uh, But actually, I've got it wrong, the actual job was drilling holes. It wasn't just making drills, it was making Holes, and they spent years and years and years and years making drills until someone discovered that one of the best ways you can make a hole that they were wanting to make was by laser. And so they went from making drills to start making lasers because they made better holes. Okay? Sometimes we think that the main thing is the main thing, but then we discover that the main thing that we thought was the main thing isn't the main thing. And the results that we want to see, we think we can get them by doing this thing, but actually we want to do it by the other thing. And the reason I'm saying is that because sometimes we get ourselves into a right fankle uh, because we believe that all we need to do in order that people can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ is for us to have the very best place to meet in. I mean, aren't we in the best this morning? Aren't we in the laps of luxury? We, we think that we have to have the best music. Did you hear all those wrong notes? We, we think we have to have the best tea and the best coffee and the best car park and the best toilets. Have you been in the toilets? Uh, all, all, we, we, think, we think we have to have the right, the right words to say. We think we have to have the cleverest thing 
to say in order that people will all of a sudden want to follow Jesus. We think that we are in the business of somehow winning people. If we can just get them into church and if we can get everything in the right place and somehow we get the right combination of words, then boom, it will be fine. Before we know it, we'll have to meet in five halls on a Sunday morning. Yeah? Somehow, sometimes that's where we think it is. But sometimes we have to recognise that the whole work of mission is primarily God's job. Primarily God's job is God that has a mission. And God's mission has the church. It's not that the church has a mission. It's not that the church has a mission. I think it was David Bosch that said that. It's not that the church has a mission. But the mission has a church. God has a mission. And we are as his people step into that. And that's why in these next couple of weeks we're going to focus on praying that God would do. That God would move. Now, have you ever wondered... Why does God not just do it? I mean, wouldn't that be easier? You know, think. Think think of that person that you know that you would love, love to be in a relationship with Jesus. Can you think of them? Can you not think, God, you're you're powerful. You could do this, you know. You could do this, God. Why have you not done it? Has anyone ever had that kind of thought? Why have you not done that? Why have you not done it, God? God can do it. But somehow, in ways that I'm still trying to understand, I'm still trying to understand the manifold wisdom of God, (coughs) which would somehow use my pathetic, ridiculous (coughs) prayers in partnership with his mission. That somehow, that God's movement in the world is linked to our prayers and action. Isn't that, doesn't that sound stupid? And you know something, every time I say it, I have to think, am I wrong? Did I, get, did I just get that wrong? Did I just um, commit a heresy this morning? That somehow God in his mercy chooses to partner with us in our actions, but in our prayers, God responds to our prayers. When Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he teaches them to pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're invited to step into this thing where we are inviting God's kingdom to become, to come where we are in our environments in partnership with us. Sounds stupid, but that is what God does. And so we're going to explore this morning these first two things. As I say, the Romans passage is usually really just where we're bouncing off of. That, that beautiful passage of uh, salvation that, that talks about what God has accomplished through Jesus and what the aim of it is that we might know hope and peace and grace and love and all those sorts of things. But as we think of uh, conviction, um, I want to invite us to look at um, a passage in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. And uh, this little passage here it is Paul talking about that time when he wrote to the Corinthians and made them feel a bit bad, okay? So in 1 Corinthians, um, the letter of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul has written to the church about lots of different things. He basically spends chapters and chapters and chapters telling them off. And uh, the result of that telling off was that they felt a bit rotten. Uh, they, felt, they felt really convicted. Did you ever get that, Ronnie? When you get told off, you know, you feel a bit rotten, you know? Um, And and that was the situation uh, they were in. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 11. Just listen to these verses. Paul says, Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful, as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what Paul's saying there? He he said, "I, I had to tell you the thing that you really didn't want to hear. In order that, not just so that you could feel that you've been hit about the head with a brush, so that the Spirit of God might be working on you to help you realise what's going on, 
Not to make you feel guilty forever. Anyone got an A-level in guilt? You know? Um, but so that you can come to repentance and freedom. Now, repentance is a beautiful thing. You know what it's like when you're walking on the street, walking along the street, and you think, I could really do with a scone. You know? And, and you're walking along this, this, this road, and you think, there's no scones up here. I'm going to turn around and go that way because I, I know that there's scones there. This, uh, this is a life experience, a weekly, daily life experience. <laughs> In the process of turning around from the wrong direction to move towards the right direction, the scone direction, you then discover that there's opportunity uh, to get yourself a scone. Now, it might mean more walking. I might feel a bit sort of sorry for myself because it's raining and I'm having to walk a little bit further in order to get to the scone. I might feel miserable about that. But the result is a scone. Um, and scones are great spiritual illustrations for anything. Um, this, is, this is kind of what Paul's saying here. Look, we, we, we get to the situations where we're walking down wrong roads. Everyone ever walk down a wrong road? I don't mean just physically, but like something you got stuck in. And it's the thing you don't want to do. And the thing, like Paul said, the thing you don't want to do is the thing you end up doing. Anyone ever been there? Uh, and you sort of can live in that cycle, not just for a couple of days, but you can live in that cycle for years. Uh, and we won't have any public confession uh, this morning unless you really want to. Those things that we just persist in, and the things in themselves make us jolly miserable because we, we get the guilt. Uh, we get that sort of, it's almost like that sort of worldly sorrow because we don't do anything with it and we just feel miserable with it. We just feel absolutely miserable. But it is God's desire not to leave us in our misery, but to leave us into, and lead us into this beautiful thing called Repentance so that we might know freedom. I think that's the difference between conviction and condemnation. The difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation which comes from the evil one will leave you miserable as sin. Remember that phrase? I think that's where it comes from. It will leave you miserable as sin, wallowing, and will send you into the depths. But God's conviction, which comes to us by the Holy Spirit, has the purpose of sticking a mirror right in your face, helping you see and think, I need that washed. I need that washed. And it's a beautiful thing. Because in that moment, the Holy Spirit works an absolute wonder. It's like you've been wandering around with this burden. And the Holy Spirit alights upon us. And you feel that, you feel that sharpening. You know, you feel that it's like the scalpel's knife gets in there and you think, the panic rises up, oh, am I done with? Am I finished? But actually, it's the gracious work of the Holy Spirit highlighting something that he can deal with, he can remove, he can change. There might be plenty of people in the world who will remind you of your sins. You know them? Have you met them before? Remember that time you, you know, but when, when we come... With to God, it's like he removes our sins far from us. As far as the east is from the west, so he removes our transgression from us. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it often comes through sometimes hearing the challenging things from God. That was what the law was for. Did you know that? You know those Ten Commandments and all those other little laws? That's what it was for. Paul says in Galatians that it's like the law was like a school teacher. Uh, uh, there to show us how wrong we are. Isn't that right, Mrs. Clark? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Walker? Yeah, yes? Uh, no, 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 it's not like that at all. But that's what Paul says. It's like a, the law is put in charge to, to reflect back to us some of those places where we need grace in our lives. And it can be difficult to hear and to accept that we have been in sin. What, what, do, you think, what do you think the biggest sin of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland is. That was a rhetorical question, you know. I, I, I actually think, I actually think its root is in pride. Its root is in pride because we will go any extra mile to pretend that we are not sinners in need of God's grace. We're not sinners in need of I, I think we'll go 10 extra miles to show ourselves to be good, right, upstanding citizens. And that prevents us so often 
from allowing that <laughs> grace of God to penetrate our hearts, to, to feel that conviction <coughs> that leads us to repentance, which brings us ultimately to joy. We are establishers <coughs> of walls around the heart. And so in praying for a moving of the Holy Spirit in the work of conviction, we are asking that God will be a demolisher of walls. A demolisher of walls. You don't need to show your hands, but do any of us have a hard heart this morning? Do any of us have a hard heart? Are any of us in denial that we need continually to throw ourselves back upon Jesus as our saviour? Do you know something? There's not an awful lot of our own inclination that will move us to do something about that. It's only God who can work. It's only God who can do it. And so if we want to see a renewal of God's spirit and moving upon our island, let's be praying that God will increase his presence and power in the beautiful work of conviction. That by his power, he might start bringing down the walls. I want to tell you something. This, this is going to be new to you. You ready for this? You ready for it? This is just going to be new to you. You are not the Holy Spirit. Okay? You are not the Holy Spirit. We have to be faithful to God's word, but we are not the plier of guilt. We have to be true to the gospel, but we are not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will do that. Let's be praying for that. So conviction, are you okay with conviction? Have you got conviction about conviction? Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We're praying for conviction. Then the next one we're thinking about is conversion. Uh, conversion. Is anyone converted? Yes. Oh, some of you. That's good. That's good. It, it seems like an old-fashioned word. It, it's an old-fashioned word that used to be around a lot in my early Sally Army days. You know, uh, especially by, uh, by small brigadiers about this height with big bonnets and big floppy. Are you converted, son? I say, yes, brigadier, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, go into all, all that. Uh, and, and, and having that, 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 that sense that there needs to be that change. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in churches where they talk about, um, they used to talk about <coughs> trophies of grace. Remember, have you done that phrase, anybody? I mean, really old fashioned. You know, if, if someone got converted and they got gloriously converted, you became a trophy of grace. Once he was a filthy, rotten drunkard in the streets and now he's singing for Jesus. Isn't he such a wonderful trophy of grace? Now, if you've been brought up in the church all your life and you've been obedient to Jesus for as long as you can remember, well, you were kind of a, a, a trinket of grace. You weren't that important. But if we got the big sinners, you were a trophy of grace. And so there's a whole load of um, language around this idea, which sometimes, certainly in contemporary, uh, contemporary church circles, puts us off this whole idea that there's, at the very heart of the gospel, uh, in response to that command to repent, there is a turning, there's a changing, and there's something spiritual in the hearts of people that changes and everyone experiences it differently. Look at my wife and I. My wife is over there. Tracy, Tracy was trundled along to the Salvation Army um, in the womb. You know, she, she came out playing a, 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 a tambourine, you know, uh, and was a good girl, went to church every single Sunday, perfect little hat and all that sort of thing, and sang with the kids' choir and the band, and, and all the way through, and all the way through her life, you know, following Jesus. And then it was me, born to the heathen of the heathens in, uh, in, in, in Dreghorn, as you know. You know. Didn't know anything about Jesus. And then, you know, completely different. We arrived at relationship with Jesus from completely different places. But we arrived. We arrived at that place. Um, it happens differently for lots of different people. Let me give me a little illustration. Uh, imagine you're in Aberdeen, terrible thing, I know, it's cold, cold, frozen place. But imagine you're in Aberdeen, train station, even colder, and you're heading to London, even more miserable place, okay? You're in Aberdeen, and you are heading to London. Got that in your mind? Got that in your map? So you, there's two of you get on the train. One of you is awake the entire way, and you know the exact point where you're train, and you know the exact time when your train crosses the border from the great nation of Scotland into our neighbours in England, okay? But your other friend got on the train at Aberdeen, slept all the way through, but all of a sudden, by the miracles of 
rail travel ended up in London and wasn't it a glory? You know, there, there are some of us who, who just grow into that awareness and we're not necessarily sure that we can put an exact point on when it happened because it seems like we've just been in that place of getting to know God and then all of a sudden we recognise that yeah, we are established in this relationship with God. We've arrived in London. But there are others of us that know exactly the time and the place and what you were wearing, you know, 17th of October, 1995, 6.55 in the evening, kneeling at a branch in front of the service. That was me. That's where, I, that's where I sort of made that transition. But there is a transition that takes place. Listen to Paul again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. It says, for he has, that's Jesus, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's basically saying there is a transfer window. There is a moment spiritually in the life of an individual where in one place, they're in the grips of the kingdom of darkness. They are not in the kingdom of light. And then there's something that happens somewhere along the line through the applied work of Jesus by the Holy Spirit, which means that they're now in the kingdom of the Son of light and good. And, you know, you'd be amazed how unpopular an idea that can be in the church. But it, it, you know, if you look at the scripture, that's where we find it. And so when we're praying that God would move by his Holy Spirit to convict hearts. We don't want them just left in their wallowing and their misery. We want them to come into the period of transfer, recognizing that the payment has been made. A transaction has been enacted. You see, really, I can say I was saved on the 17th of October, 1995 at 6.55 in the evening. But really, I was saved when Jesus was on the cross. It's a past act. And when the Holy Spirit moves in that transformation way, then that work is applied to me. And whether you start to gradually realise that effect in your life, or whether, for like me, it was like that, the transaction has been made, the price has been paid, the beauty has been established, the work is, has been done, it is being done, and it will be done. Someday, well, anyone a work in progress? Or works in progress? We have been saved back there. We are being saved right now, right here. And one day we will be glorious. Look at the person next to you and say, You'll be glorious. And they're really, I, I like to embarrass you, you know. I mean, you will. You'll be absolutely glorious. I'm looking forward to seeing you. You know, because at the moment, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're works in progress. But there is the change. Listen to what, I've listened to Paul about this morning. Paul had a lot to say about this. Ephesians chapter 2. And to give you a hope, we're almost done. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, as for you, you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Okay? That's what we were. That's what we were. But, but... God, in his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. Isn't that great? Yeah. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works so that anyone can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? That is where we are this morning if we have come 
to Christ, recognizing that we did have a story in the past, we were amongst the disobedient, coming to Christ, recognizing in that moment that his love and mercy reach to us and covers us, and that we are now seated somewhere else. I've said this a few Sundays now. You might think you're sitting here in the Ormondale Pavilion on a Sunday morning waiting for your tea, but in reality, we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. We are with him. You can't get from sinful living here on the Isle of Arran to sitting in the courts of God without Jesus Christ. There is a transfer. There's a transfer window. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, listen to him. So how about it? How about we pray that God, by his Holy Spirit, will move in his beautiful, convicting work, that the walls will be broken down, that the arguments will be dismantled, that people would be found just calling out for the presence of Jesus with his saving power. And how about we pray that God would continue in an increasing way to draw people into his kingdom and that somehow he might use us as his messengers, as his intercessors, as his labourers in the vineyard. The fields are white and the harvest, but the labourers are few. Here am I, send me. Let's just remember one last thing. There's a population of 5,000 people on the Isle of Arran, especially this time of the year when everyone's gone home. Around about 5,000 people. I would say to you this morning that there's only about 2 or 3% of those people who are in church. And of that 2 or 3% of those who are sitting in church this morning, we can't say that 100% have been through the transfer. This is why we pray for the Spirit's work in conviction, for the Spirit's work in conversion, for the increase of amazing grace, for the lifting up of the name of Jesus, and the faith that as we lift him up, all men will be drawn to him. How about it, folks? How about it? Your friends, your neighbours, your family. We don't want to beat them about the head. We want them to know the goodness of God, don't we? To know the goodness of God. Well, may his spirit, first of all, be at work 